We were wanting to set it up on our lab. Yeah, we we did the uh, the unicorn challenge on your guys' website. Uh, did you? Like, or we tried to. We I was gonna say. I was like, <laughs> give me a resume. I uh, yeah, I ended up I wrestled with that one for a couple days. Yeah, and I mean it wasn't like constant, like 48 hours I was in the grind, you know. Um, but it was like a, it's a tough problem, but it definitely shows like you can do that, you can do a lot of cool stuff. So, but yeah, for those that didn't hear in the back, the we have Battelle challenges, and there's one called Undercover Unicorn, um, and it involves using unicorn, which I'm going to talk about today, um, but basically sending some shell script, some shell code over the wire, making your shell code do some other stuff with different shell code. It's multi-architectural. So it's like, it really challenge you, ch challenges you to, to like understand not only like systems in general, but emulation, networking aspect, like all of that good stuff. So it's, it's really cool. And so you, you messed with it for how long? Uh, we only messed with it for like maybe 30 minutes before we realized that 32 we minutes probably... and you would have been fired. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's when you would have figured it out. All right, I'm getting a connection error on the UC Cyber Guest or UC Guest. There we go. Yeah, here you can just log into my Wi Fi. So. I think I got it too. Okay. I'll pop it open in the DM so I can like, screw up that one. There you go. <laughs> yeah, if you guys are interested in doing like you know CTF kind of problems like that, um, Patel also has a goats problem that they have us on their site. We actually walked through that in one of our old meetings last year, so definitely something to also check out. I think that's goats. goats. It right. is. It's a Billy Goat problem, but that was just an interesting way to goats. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Battelle's just really into goats. That's what it is. <laughs> and, and their stomachs. You know? yeah. yeah, and it's actually mm -hmm. funny because like, so has Todorov been down here? You know John Todorov? Mm -hmm. um, I've just been McCanty so far. Okay, he's another engineer at Battelle, but he wrote that and he has a, a pretty funny sense of humor. But he involved like actual science behind a goat. It has like four stomachs or something, and it's like, <laughs> it, it's it's really funny. Yeah. But, it's a great great like, intro too. Yeah, it's like a very. Um, yeah, it's very approachable. We do at high schools. Show some high schools. Yeah. So well, I'm actually in Cyber Academy right now, and we use Billy Goat as like a toy example to uh, throw anger at it, and anger can like solve it in like a second and a half. Yeah, it's crazy. Anger. Also, if you program anger wrong, it will have a state explosion, and your processor will probably catch on fire. So it's. <laughs> Yeah, who's familiar with anger? Never. Probably not anybody, actually. Okay, so anger is really kick-ass, too. It's a, a concolic and symbolic execution engine. Um, it's used highly in academia for research. Um, I'm going to butcher this because I'm definitely not an expert in this area. But it basically takes it to another layer of abstraction with the language that it, it basically tries to execute. You can think of it kind of like emulation, but if I have something in ARM, versus x86 like it, it's going to use vex to get it into the same level of abstraction and then you can basically say like you know don't go down this branch or this function tree and only go down this path and you can do that and it takes a little bit of like manual reverse engineering to actually set it up but you can solve a problem like this that might take us like 45 minutes or an hour and it's literally just like okay i'm just not going to go here i'm going to go here i'm not going to go here and it's like solved it's pretty kick-ass if you're good with anger like you're gonna be a backbone of a CTF team. So if you're interested in that and you have time, you should play with that. And I'm still opening VMs. That's so. a A and G R, right? Yeah, A and G R. Yeah. All right, let's do new. Where's the uh, Where's the Adriaticos down here? Uh, like right off of campus, not that okay. far. Yeah. Because we, we have one like right by campus at OSU. We actually had Adriatico's last night. Nice. It's a uh, it's close to my heart. So. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. Yeah. All right, so we got that one. 
And I apologize for the setup and like being late and everything, but I promise it'll be worth it. Or maybe I should set the bar a little lower and then. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I guess while we're waiting, um, who has heard of fuzzing? All right, does anyone want to tell me what fuzzing is? What's up? Yeah. Uh, supplying inputs to a program to see if you can get like. Okay. Yeah. Um, does somebody want to like expand upon that a little bit? I dig that. That's a very like you know abstract view of it. Um, nobody? Come on, guys, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to talk about it today, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit deeper, um, but I want to give you a general idea so you understand like how AFL works, like what AFL, what fuzzing is in general, why we do it in the cybersecurity realm, um, and what, what that benefits us. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you a toy example, um, and hopefully this will give kind of like have some light bulbs come off with you on like why we would use it, but it is it's too it's so we can find bugs because as uh, cybersecurity researchers we don't we don't really care about like the if you program a function to like output yes, um, but if we can get it to jump into another function and then go into another function and do some you know it's like that's what we're interested in like the the weird internal state of that binary, um, and fuzzing helps us get to that. And the cool thing with fuzzing, you can basically like unleash it on its own, kind of just like set it on a processor and let it let it do its thing, and you can still continue to do like manual reverse engineering research. So um, <clears throat> definitely one of those like buzzwords in the research field right now, um, and it's also a very practical in um, a lot of cybersecurity techniques. Like you probably you see a, you see it a lot in like DefCon, um, other conferences here. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very good thing to kind of get a grasp onto and like what it actually does. Yeah, some background, I guess, as to what we've covered so far this semester, um, we, we're kind of building up uh, from a lot of the basics covering a lot of these. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure almost everyone here should have like a VM with some tools set up on it by now and some other stuff, so. Do you guys use like pen tools or anything or? Um, yeah. Well, we haven't really covered that yet, but we'll get it Actually, there. I'm not super, like I use it every now and then for CTS, but I'm like, I normally just use like the raw tools on their own, because it just basically is just like a cluster of everything. Yeah. There's, uh, there's some stuff you just can't read it, but for a lot of the stuff you can. Yeah, you can get around. Also, you guys have, you added me to the, I'm on the Slack mm -hmm. now. I want to share a link with you guys for who does have a laptop. Your guys' uh, Slack URL. Cyber at UC. Cyber at UC. Are you about to uh, post your unicorn scripts? GitHub. Yeah. I already did it. You did? Okay, cool. How? Did you just. <laughs> I can see the future. <laughs> My man, we need to talk after this. All right, so what's going on here? What's the setup? Why can I see my stuff back there, but I can't see stuff? I'm going to change every. The one over there cuts stuff. off about uh, six inches on the left. That one cuts off six inches on the right. <laughs> you, just have, you just have to look really fast. We can't like, recalibrate <laughs> them. So, yeah. What the hell? Um, Your screen's just black. No, it's not black, but it's like. I mean, I wanted to do everything on like the same thing. I just oh, yeah, mirror that. displays, right? That. Yeah. Go back to arrangement. Mm -hmm. Bottom left, mirror Yay. displays. There you go. Flag number one. <laughs> uh -oh. All right. All right, we're good. <laughs> All right, 
Okay, so we got Windows, we got Linux. Let's get these guys. You already posted that, so I don't care about that. All right, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry you dropped that. Um, so yeah, I'm Noah Kritz. Um, today I'm going to talk to you guys about VR and various tools that we use at Patel. And a little bit about like Patel in general, but more importantly, why are we here? We're here for cyber. So I'm going to talk to you about Patel Cyber. Um, in a nutshell, though, like I said, Patel, Patel Cyber. Um, this is an internal research and development project that I got to work on in the past few months. Um, but I'm going to use this opportunity to kind of like break down various tools for you guys and build up the idea of like why it's important, why it's cool, um, how we can use it for CTFs, all that kind of stuff. Um, Lighthouse is a really interesting tool. Um, it's an open source code coverage visualization tool. So how many people are familiar with like Ida, Radare, Binary Ninja, Ghidra? Everybody, I hope. Um, awesome. So like imagine if you're looking at a piece of code and you know that you executed something and it went down a certain path and that you could color that entire path of the function blocks. Be pretty nice, right? Um, that's what Lighthouse does. Um, so we basically, we have AFL Unicorn, which we, we built. Um, Nathan Voss was an engineer at Patel. He built that, open sourced it. There's some like videos on it in depth and like tutorials and all that. I'm going to give you guys kind of like a bottom up um, approach to all that. Um, but the effort of this IRAD was basically bolting on that lighthouse functionality to it. So we can get, when we fuzz it, whenever we hammer it with inputs, um, I'm going to basically log the state of what happened in that binary. And then whenever I open it up in Ida or Ghidra or whatever, it'll pop out at me. So like a reverse engineer like myself, I don't have to sit there and be like, okay, what address was this crash at? What was this at? Like it, le it legitimately just like pops out at you. Um, and so this really just makes it a lot faster in CTFs and, you know, if we're going to work for a client. So it's, it's kind of nice. Um, and after that, I'm going to sit around and we can, you know, if you have any questions, um, comments, concerns, I'm also going to Ryan guys after this. So if anybody wants to join with that, it's a different story though. So um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, about me. I have a wife, a son, a dog. I have another little one on the way. Um, I work at Battelle as a computer engineer. I've been there for a little over two years now. I was a co-op for two years, about a year and a half, and then I transitioned to full-time. Love it. It's awesome. Um, graduated from OSU with a CSE degree. And uh, some hobbies that I have, I like doing web and mobile app dev. A um, little bit lighter on the brain. You know, it's still fun, but a lot of forward engineering. We still like to build cool stuff as engineers, right? I do CrossFit. Um, it's fun. I actually convinced him somehow to sign up to my gym. And uh, CrossFit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a good time. And I really enjoy good beer and playing chess. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so what's Patel? And I promise this is going to be a little bit lighter weight, and then we'll dive into cyber and then talk about the technical stuff. But um, Patel is literally the world's largest independent uh, research and development organization. And it's like, when I heard that, I didn't really believe it at first, but then I realized that we own, like we manage a lot of national labs. Um, so we orchestrate a lot of like the business side of like Oak Ridge and other big places that do a lot of really cool research. Um, but what really drives me is this stuff right here, not that. Um, the vision and the mission. Um, the vision with delivering remarkable and impactful science, technology, engineering outcomes to solve our nation's most difficult challenges, like that doesn't go, that's not missed at the work that we do. You know you're like on the forefront of like whether it's military operations or whether it's uh, some type of government entity whatever it is like we're making a difference in where we live today and it's it's evident in everything that we're doing um, and this is really what drove me like the mission to translate scientific discovery and technology into societal benefits like I honest to God thought I was gonna be a web developer like four or five years ago which is cool I, I mean it's fun and it's like you enjoy that and there's a whole career and you're gonna make a lot of good money and make you know all that but um there is nothing like knowing like we're going to school to be an engineer i'm getting taught physics i'm getting taught calculus like all that stuff we get to apply that every day to do kick-ass stuff 
And like, that is what this mission statement means to me. You know? Like, it means so much more than just saying like, I, I slang divs on the website or I'm, I'm building an app that actually it lines people's pockets on management higher up and all that. And it's like, it's still fun. I do that as a hobby, you know, but it's like, um, there's something about that. It just changes the nature of like everything that you're doing. Um, but yeah, and this is just a, kind of an overview of some of the the products that we've actually created. Again, we're, we're mainly in the government space, but a lot of the projects that we can talk about are, are up here. Um, and some of the ones worth mentioning, um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, I mean, there's the US Nautilus, there's the UPC code, that's on like everything, right? Um, CDs, which is cool, so, you know, that's that's awesome, even though like some people might not know what that is in a couple years. <laughs> um, this is this is wild, the NeuroLife project and the Battelle Drone Defender is awesome. And this is one of the things I wanted to emphasize with you guys. Um, these were IRADs, these were internal research and development efforts. And it was basically like a couple knuckleheads like me and him, like we could say like, hey, I have this idea. I think it's possible. I think we can do this. Can you give me some money so we can actually accomplish this? And we write up a white paper or whatever. We hand it in and they say, yeah, here's X amount of money. And we get to work on what we want to work on. And we make cool stuff happen. Um, I'm going to save the best for last. And that, that's the NeuroLife one. But the Battelle Drone Defender was basically a bunch of like mechanical and electrical engineers that were like, man, it's a problem overseas now where like terrorists are like strapping grenades to like drones they're buying at Best Buy and flying them into our troops or into helicopters and stuff. And like, but we need a non-invasive way to take these down. We can just shoot them down and like, because it might explode somewhere and we can't control that. Um, they basically were like, what if we throw a ton of electromagnetic junk at it and just see what it does it might panic it might do a backflip it might do something weird but like it turns out it works really well jams that device and you can literally it also makes a nice this shape like an nk-47 but you can point it and literally <laughs> bring the drone down like nice and safe and like i think the second iteration of that is out now but like soldiers use that overseas and like it all started with like a couple guys like hey we can do this let's make this happen and the craziest one, at least with my mind, because I'm not a big medical guy, but is the NeuroLife. And this started as a, an IRAD where they basically implanted a chip in a paraplegic's body, uh, not body, in his brain. And they can read the electrical signals from his brain and translate that into muscle stimulation on a little wrap that they have on his arm. And he can control his arm now. Um, that's mind blowing. So they use a lot of machine learning. They use a lot of I mean, they have electrical engineers, they have, they do their due diligence with everything um, for making like med devices. Cause you can imagine like code reviews and all that stuff. And it's like really sophisticated software and hardware. Um, what kind of put it over the top for me though was whenever they told me, okay, we have the, the patient's name is Ian. And uh, they said, we have Ian playing a video game and he couldn't play video games before, but he's like, he's playing a video game, he's watching the screen, like imagine playing Call of Duty or something. And like, they, they learn, he, it learned how he plays a video game. So they take, take it a next step. They grab the controller, take the controller away. And just by watching the screen, he can play the video game and send signals to the gaming console and play. <laughs> That's crazy, come on. That's insane, right? So like, this is stuff that our guys put their minds to and do, and like, that's unbelievable, man. Um, and the cool thing about Battelle is like, you, we do have opportunities to overlap with other groups. So like, I mean, there are pacemakers and stuff that need cybersecurity. Like, who wants to get their heart hacked? You know, like, <laughs> we overlap with that kind of stuff. Um, and it's just, it's a really interesting, unique, and selfless cause for everything we're doing. This is all for society. Um, but that's all I'm going to say about Battelle Total. Um, so we're in the National Security Group. There's an environmental and a health group also. Um, but we fall in the National Security Group. Um, we have people from literally all kinds of backgrounds, but mainly like uh, computer scientists, electrical engineers, mathematicians, RF guys, and data scientists. So we have like whatever you need. If we need to crack crypto, we have mathematicians. We have data scientists. If we need 
to like rip the firmware off of a board. We have electrical engineers. We have, we need everything basically. Um, but this group basically breaks down into three different areas. I'm an MFT right here. Drew is in uh, trust and assurance. So I'm gonna have him talk here in a moment about what they do there because it's crazy as well. Um, MFT is like mission focused tools. Obviously we do like mission focused tools. <laughs> so it's like, I know that's, it's funny, but it's, uh, we do, st basically I'm gonna talk about the uh, vulnerability research life life cycle here in a minute, but if somebody comes to us, some agency, and says, hey, we believe that this terrorist has this type of device, we need to get into this device so we can take him down, right? We need to basically get that information, get that intel, and say, I'm going to reverse engineer this in whatever ways, maybe take the firmware off a chip, um, throw into Ida, throw into Ghidra, all that stuff, figure out where is this thing vulnerable? You know, find that vulnerability, develop an exploit, build a tool so basically our client can like push a button or something and it ex exploits them. The operator wins, that wins that small battle, that mission, we take a guy down. Um, that's a really cool way to explain like what we're doing, but it's like, um, that's in, re in reality, that's really like, that's what's going on. Like we have, we have these needs that we're trying to fill and our job is to like, we have the operators overseas and doing all these like really crazy things, risking their lives. And like, we're building tools to like help them in the field. Um, but yeah, that's, we do a lot of, of, of VR, so vulnerability research. And that's why I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of dive into the tools that I use with that and discuss this. But I wanna give Drew the stage for a minute so we can talk about some of the cool stuff we do to like get firmware off and like, we shoot lasers at stuff, and like I'm just gonna I'm gonna let him do his thing. So, so I'm Drew, also from Battelle. I'm a computer engineer from OSU. Uh, similar background to Noah. Interned there for a couple of years. Got hired full time this summer. It's a good time. But my uh, concentration is a little bit different than his. I mostly work with hardware stuff, and a lot of the hardware stuff that we do is is pretty sweet. So we're called uh, Trust and Assurance. Basically, the big umbrella that we're under is the idea of trusted hardware. So we want to make sure that the hardware that we are designing and sending off overseas to get built uh, is what we ordered, making sure the thing coming back to us is the thing that we sent. Uh, we don't really have a lot of silicon fabrication abilities here in the US. We can't make our own chips, so when someone wants a new computer, Intel designs a new processor. They send the design to the foundry in China. They make what we assume is a correctly made Intel processor and send it back, but for all we know, anyone with access to those GDS files or, or the design files in between there could insert something in that processor and we would have no way to detect it. So a lot of our work is focused on uh, developing the tools and the methods to take those devices that are untrusted and make sure that they are what we think they are. There's also a lot of, um, it's, it's mainly concerned with like military applications. If I'm making a cool new fighter jet, I wanna make sure that the ARM processors that are going in the flight control system don't have some weird backdoor that was inserted into them. Uh, pretty important stuff. A lot of mission critical components need to be tested. The Air Force has a lot of stuff with that that's, that's important. Basically supply chain stuff. We also do, in addition to that, a lot of firmware recovery and reverse engineering. <laughs> so say you get uh, a drone, an unknown drone that crashed from, uh, it's never been seen before, crashed on our side of enemy lines. We want to see what is this thing? How does it work? What's running on it? What are they doing? They give parts to some people like us. We can use our cool tools to take that chip apart, look at the circuits inside, see what it's doing. We can extract firmware from it. A lot of fun stuff. Uh, there's a couple different ways. I guess I can talk about firmware recovery stuff because that's that's the fun part. I know we can talk about the acid. And yeah, I know we can yeah. talk about the lasers. So okay, we've got acid, we've got acid lasers. lasers. <laughs> we've got some really cool lasers. I don't really understand the lasers as much because I'm just a lowly computer engineer, but. <laughs> Basically, if we get a chip in, we want to know what's inside it. We can use acid to etch away at the layers of the, uh, the epoxy and closing it and get down to like the actual dye inside the chip, the exposed circuit. And once we have that, we can do whatever we want with it. We can have, uh, we have lasers. We can use lasers to induce charges at different points in the board. So we could flip a bit in memory. If there's a security bit that says this chip's locked, you can't read memory off of it. You could point a laser at that bit and shine it just right and cause it to flip its state and suddenly you have full control of that chip. 
We have uh, the ability to edit ships. We have a fib sun, a fi finite ion beam. Is that what it is? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Finite ion beam combined with a uh, scanning electron microscope so we can zoom in on circuits of that ship and we can actually use lasers and ion beams. And I'm not a materials guy, so I don't know how this works. But we can make edits to a chip that's already been designed. So we can bypass circuitry. We can make changes to things in ROM, all kinds of fun stuff. So. That's a lot of what we do in uh, trust and assurance, basically pulling stuff off of chips that we're not supposed to be able to get off of, and also making sure that things are what they say they are. That's right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, like you said, that's the main that's the main purpose of this group. This guy, I was trying to get a definition for this guy <laughs> <laughs> in the past couple of days, and this is just kind of like a new founded group for us. Um, but we basically have guys in Virginia and Melbourne, Florida as well, in the cyber group, we all do the same kind of stuff. Um, but they get their own identity with cyber solutions. So they're, we're sharing the workload with all this, um, but we just have some cool other locations. Um, so yeah, my two cents about all this. <laughs> um, I love it, man. And I know I can speak for him too. It's it's so much fun. And I think I gave you the spiel about like the purpose behind it. It's different than just dip, you know developing and like nine to five kind of work. Like there's a purpose to everything, but on top of that, we're working with some incredible people. Um, I think I've been around more PhDs while I'm at work than I am whenever I'm like at school. And that's like, that's just wild to me because you can go like poke at them, extract knowledge from them and just say like, hey, help me on this diff EQ, like whatever. And like, we have people that are like, oh, I got you, you know, and they can like take you down this rabbit hole really fast. Um, that's, that's, that's a beautiful part about the resources that we have and everything, but like the IRAD budget is unbelievable and like I mentioned about having um, you know these ideas that we can just basically say hey I think this is possible let's develop this into something big um, Battelle across the board has a budget that we can hit every year but Battelle cyber specifically has a million dollar IRAT budget per year um, that's crazy so like we have a lot of people with a lot of very good ideas and we get to do a lot of cool stuff um, part of that is coming to places like this, going to conferences, <coughs> talking about the stuff that we do, sharing re research with people, and it's just, it's a really cool community to have. Um, I mean, I know some of our guys went paintballing last, last weekend. Um, it's a really, it's like, a, it's like a family, you know? Um, so all good things, you know, all good things. There's, it's a, it's a fun place and it's a, you're, you're going to see some of the tools that we use, but there's there's a lot of places that you can apply and that you can do like this kind of sort of research with, but the resources that we have at our disposal is phenomenal. So that's all I have to say about Battelle in general. Um, let's talk about some hacking stuff. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, this is where like somebody says like, hey, we have this target that I believe is vulnerable, we need to get into said device and start attacking people. We get a concept of operations, assuming like the contract, everything goes through. Um, we grab that, we start reverse engineering it, we might tear firmware off, we might, whatever we have to do, we get into it. Um, we have to discover a vulnerability, we start developing the exploit, then we make a tool for them. So they can push a button and win, right? So like this blue area right here is where we hang out. Like this is our bread and butter. This is what we do on a daily basis. And this is why we enjoy what we do. Um, the operator, post exploitation, collection effect, maybe collection and effect comes around to us as well, like continuing contracts and all that. But um, we hand it off to somebody that's a lot more badass than me and anyone else in our, you know, that can go and like they're overseas doing stuff, whatever it is. And they're taking you know, this tool and they're weaponizing it, right? Um, so that's kind of an overview, but the tools that I'm going to talk about today are going to be sitting right inside of here. So we have this whole spectrum of vulnerability research, but we're going to be, the tools that we're talking about directly affect the speed of these two. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so this is, uh, we call it Lost Unicorn. We have code names for all the IRADs that we do. My goal was to find, so because it's a lost unicorn, my goal was to find like the most like 
like spiritually lost unicorn that I could find. <laughs> so and like that's that's what I came up with. Um, but yeah, that's uh, not an official logo or anything. But um, yeah, like as I was mentioning er earlier, uh, Lighthouse is a visual code coverage tool for us. So as you can see, like this is that oh so common menu that we see. Um, reverse engineering stuff, taking apart binaries and everything. You see the function graph, but what's different in this one is it's painted for us, right? Um, so like, if I'm doing some research and I'm fuzzing it, or you can use it in other ways. There's other reasons, you know, tools that use Lighthouse and like log Lighthouse logs. Um, but for fuzzing, it's so helpful to see like, hey, I'm attacking this function. I'm putting an input right here. I kind of want to get over there but it keeps going down this path, you know, and I can visually see that and it just like, it clicks with you and you can start, you can pivot in your research or you can, you know, it just speeds everything up. So you can see the, uh, the benefit of that. Um, AFL, again, who's all familiar with AFL? Iffy, who's, and who's familiar with fuzzing? Quite a good bit with fuzzing, but I'll, I mean, I'm going to break it down for you um, in mundane terms. Um, I basically can hand it some inputs that it would probably be expecting. So like, if I have a parsing function, I might hand it like a packet, right? In that packet, it's gonna take certain parts of that packet, grab it, and like make sure it's correct, or make sure that the content makes sense. Um, but for very simple purposes in this presentation, we're gonna consider like one, two, three, four, right? Um, so if that's a sample input, a fuzzer is basically going to take that and say, okay, I'll assume this is correct. It's already not going to crash your system. So I'm going to mutate that in whatever way I choose using various algorithms like Havoc, bit swapping, stuff like that. Very advanced mathematical stuff. Um, but all we care about is what it's, what it's actually producing for us. And it might extend the length of that input. It might half it, it might take it away, it might null it out, it might, it's going to do a bunch of stuff to generate a bunch of chaos, basically. Um, and that's kind of the idea behind fuzzing. Like, you see that fuzzy screen on your TV and everything? It's like one, two, three, four might very quickly turn into, like, this, you know? Um, so it's literally just constantly mutating stuff and just hammering in on whatever function. And if it, if it goes down into, you know, down here it's checking that it's like, it is one, two, three, four. Okay, that's cool, let's go down here. But if it's one, two, three, five, it might go over here and we get completely different internal state of the binary. I know I may be beating a dead horse, but I really want that point across because it's like, it's very solid for you to understand that. Um, unicorn, this is the other half of this beast. It's, a, it's an emulator, right? Um, so I asked in the beginning, who's familiar with emulation? And somebody said, Video games, right? So like everyone's had some type of emulation with like an NES or N64 or something like that. The way they do that is all in software, right? So like they're, if an N64 has a certain type of processor, it has certain registers inside of it, they can define all that stuff as structures using C or Rust or whatever. And they basically, everything is literally in the software stack, right? So it's, it's not touching the hardware underneath. <clears throat> Whereas something like I mentioned earlier with virtualization, like VMware or a hypervisor, um, VirtualBox, all that, it's actually reaching down into the internals and using your hardware on the host machine. Um, so that's the difference. That's good to understand as well. Um, emulation is just purely in the software area. Um, and as you can see, it supports a bunch of architectures. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, but I'm going to take you guys on a little journey with... Uh, some examples I have, and we're gonna build it up. So, did any has anybody used Unicorn at all? No. Okay. So he said, "What's your name, man?" Chris. Chris. Chris said that he posted a link to my GitHub Unicorn scripts that and that's on here. So if you guys want to check them out, you can go through and like run them yourself, modify them, have fun with them, and all that. But I'm basically gonna go from a very basic example, just running some code and like you know outputting some result, to like adding a stack to it, and then adding some data to it. Right, so we get to control all of this through an API, which is really nice. Um, so let me get over here. So this is just a Ubuntu 16 instance. I'm in a VM. Um, here's my three examples. Um, 
So can you guys see this? Is that too small? Anyone feedback? I think we're good. You think you're good? I don't see it. I'm gonna try to aim. Which one is it? I'll uh, just flip them all up. Yeah, just flip them. All of them? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Oh, there we go. Is that yeah, is that pretty good now. for you guys? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can you guys close the window too? <laughs> You're like the one guy you have like out. one beam of sunlight right in the eyes. Um, do you have your dot file on your phone? I do. That's a nice work. Thank you. I work so hard. <laughs> I like the icons. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That actually takes a while to install. Um, so I normally comment that out, but I kept doing this one. But yeah, nerd <laughs> fun. It like takes like, it's way too long. But yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, anyways, uh, so like this, we're gonna follow this like common theme, right? And so using AFL Unicorn, um, AFL has its own, you know, inputs that it, it desires and that it needs to run. Um, but you can also basically attach something to the side of it. So if I wanna like pipe all the input for the outputs of AFL into another process or another program, we can do that. Um, but to do that, you have to set up a test harness, okay? And you can think of a harness just like, you know, anything that you're basically attaching one device to another device. The same concept is here. Like, we're literally stitching together AFL and Unicorn. And this is gonna be, these are the building blocks that gets us to that end goal, right? Um, so in this, we have a little bit of setup. Um, this binary string right here is x86, 64, and this is what it does. So it's literally um, RAX. I'm setting RAX right here. Can you see my mic? Yeah. Um, so I'm setting RAX to five. It's going to add four, subtract two, add five, subtract two. And basically, we're going to get 10 at the end. Um, the code is a little less important than what I want to go through and, and just how to set this up. So if you get a CTF problem, it's like, hey, here's this arbitrary, like, MIPS, Little Endian, 32, like code, run it, but the register requires that you need a certain value in there. So something, I don't know, I just randomly came up with that, but you can do it with this little tiny script, right? You get that, you get the code snippet that you need to emulate, you initialize the unicorn engine, you provide it what architecture it is, what mode it's in, so 32 or 64, um, you map out the base, which you can think of this as just the text section in your virtual memory, and you're, ba you're writing the code to the base, okay? So with Unicorn, you know, it provides this API, and it's like, it's a blessing and a curse. You know, it's a blessing because we have, we have access to all these internals, like state of the actual emulation. So like we can set every single register, we can set you know, modules that we need, we can set map memory, map certain stuff to the memory, like all of that stuff. Um, but it's a curse because you have to set everything up, right? So it's a, you know, it, but it's still, it's a win-win and you have a lot of control as a, as a researcher with this. Um, but yeah, lastly here, I'm writing five to the register RAX, and then I'm just simply starting the emulation. If anything goes bad, um, I'm going to print out an exception, but I'm going to read RAX right here. All right, and then I'm just going to print it out. And we should get 10. So, let me get out of here. We're going to Python 1, and we get 10, right? Um, I know that's pretty simple, but we're going to build up on this idea. So, we got. Jeez, we got uh, two. Um, same style, so I, you know, we can make sure that we have like the same structure of everything. We have the code here. We have a base address. I can pick this arbitrarily. Um, with AFL Unicorn, we're gonna have to pick it more directly, especially if you have if it's based off certain offsets and everything. But for this, I can just I could have made this like twenty or something. You know, it could have been any, anything. Um, we have the stack address here. I just made sure to separate that from the base address so they don't collide. Uh, stack size. And same concept. We're initializing the unicorn engine. We're mapping out the base. We're mapping out the stack this time. Okay, same amount of space. We're writing the code to the base. 
we're going to set the stack pointer. Okay. And so notice how I set that up because the stack goes downwards, right? Um, so you can see how the values align with that. And then I'm writing the register values as to what the code says at the top. So I'm setting RAX to one, RBX to two, RCX to three. And I'm starting the emulation. And the same thing, I'm just reading the values and I'm printing them out. Again, very basic, but what to expect with this is we're going to push RCX. Um, so we're going to push three, pop that value back into RAX. So it's overwriting the value in RAX. And then add RBX to RAX, which we should get five in that, right? Um, so we'll run the second one. That was crazy. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to get our values right here. I think I like called tab or something. You know? was like, <laughs> um, so yeah, all is good and dandy right there. All right, so now we got example three. Now this is the one that I, I you know, try to pay attention to because this is we're actually going to put data in there. And this aligns perfectly with the AFL unicorn test harness. Um, because that example is going to be using this address as well as a data address, which you can think of and like a hardware device that could be like a predefined um, address that's always looking and seeking a certain value or seeking something that it pulled off of the wire or something. Um, or you can think, it, think of it as simply as like the heap. You know, if we malloc values and whatnot, we can just ass assume that this is where the heap value starts. So um, again, for CTF problems, having mallocs and setting all that stuff up is not an issue. Like Unicorn can take care of that for you. Um, yeah, with this one, I wrote a little helper just so it'll uh, represent the data in Little Indian whenever I print this stuff out. Um, you don't got to worry about that. But basically, you have a, with this, we have the code, the stack, and the data. And we have a typical like function prologue inside of here. Um, and then we have, uh, we're making room on the stack with ESP. So we're making room for four variables, four local variables with ESP. We're moving that address of 300,000 into one of the local variable positions. And then we're dereferencing what's inside of that position at that address um, into EAX. Um, so we're going to see the data inside of that area in memory. And that's basically all I want to show with all of this is like you're able to access memory, you're able to see everything in there, and it just it makes sense. The same thing, we're mapping out the base, the stack, the data, writing the, the code to the base. We're putting bacon into the data address. That's right, we're putting bacon in there. And then we're writing um, the stack pointer. So I, I dropped it down, looks like 32 bytes um, from the top of it, just so there was no like overlap or anything. And then we're starting the emulation. We're pulling off the registers that we want to see and the data. And then we're printing it out, just like usual, right? Um, so we're going to Python, example three. There we go. So we got the addresses. We got um, inside of data, we got bacon. That's cool. And we got our um, data address inside of that local variable, right? Excuse me. So this is the basics. These are the basics of setting up a, a unicorn script, right? And it can get more and more and more and more sophisticated. Um, but this is kind of just an overview of what we just did. You know, there wasn't a stack, there wasn't data. There was a stack, there wasn't data. And then there was a stack and there was data. Um, so now we're going to actually talk about AFL Unicorn and how can we make this test harness that actually stitches together AFL with Unicorn so we can emulate a binary and fuzz what we're emulating okay um, and again this is just a depiction of you know how we're increasing that and you're going to see some overlap in that last unicorn script that i showed you guys with the data address and everything um, so this is that command i was talking about and so i always find this interesting at least when i was doing the research on this like you can like this is the afl guts that you will see across the board most of the time um, with when somebody's running AFL. This, the end of the AFL flags right here, this is just some bash, but you can stitch it together with any other program over here. So I always thought it'd be cool to get some other 
I mean, you can do it with a script or whatever you want, but you can get the output of AFL and throw it into whatever you want. So if you guys come up with a clever way of sending packets over the wire, or like using Scapy or something, or you know, use your imagination, you know, you can get AFL's output, pipe it into whatever you want over here. Now AFL is based off of internal states. You're, you'd have to figure out some uh, some way to you know maintain the state and make sure that it understands where it's at in the binary. But other than that, like this is, it's kind of. Uh, Beautiful how everything syncs up with that. So that's a uh, let's jump over to the VM again. Let's see here. So I'm going to get out of this guy. All right. So I'm going to show you guys the target. I'm going to show you guys the test harness. Um, I'll show you the make file just to like you know sanity check everything, and then we're going to build everything. We're going to get all the values. So instead of actually having to allocate the exact state of the binary, like we did with the unicorn tests, we can use a helper script that we wrote a while back that outputs all that stuff for us in an index.json file. So it just literally lightning fast, just like craps everything out for us, which is really nice. Um, but I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. But just to give you an overview of like what you see inside of this directory, um, the core is a part of AFL. Inputs, these are those test inputs that I was talking about earlier, like the sample inputs. So like, I mean, just to give you, let's see, we'll XX the core inputs, sample one. So yeah, it looks like A, it looks like we just put A, X, Y, Z, B, C, D, a bunch of junk in that file as an input, right? Um, we'll do the second one. I think there's actually binary in one of these. That's just zero, so that's just a null. So we're just a, we're just literally giving it a bunch of stuff to start hammering on this function. It's like okay, you know, I'm gonna run that input on it, and then since it didn't crash, I'm gonna mutate it and do some other cool stuff with it. Um, so let's take a look at the target. Um, so this was written by Nathan Voss. He's the one that wrote AFL Unicorn, and this is the test example that he shows online. So if you come across his Medium article, this is, the, I snagged this right from there and I think it's just great to depict everything um, and show just like why, you know, AFO Unicorn is, is great to use. So like, if you look, this, this address is the same that we had in the Unicorn script, that last Unicorn script. <laughs> so like, you don't see this. I doubt that you've seen this in like your classes on a daily basis of just defining an address and like pointing something at it, right? Or like trying to grab something. But in the embedded world, where we do a lot of our research at Patel, a lot of hardware does do this because they have a limited amount of memory and they have access to everything on that device. A deeply de embedded device is gonna have basically like, there's gonna be offsets in whatever memory and it's just gonna grab whatever it needs, whenever it wants. So this is basically simulating a piece of binary that would be on an embedded device. Yeah. Um, again, you can use this for various things, but this is going to show um, we're going to be able to basically fuzz the value sitting at this address and make that data buffer that's expected to pull whatever's inside of that address contain a bunch of junk, right? So as this runs, it's going to hit these three conditionals. And if a particular byte inside of the value at that address is not equal to whatever the you know or it meets one of these conditions in here it's going to go in here and it's going to crash in the same way it's literally just dereferencing a pointer to zero that's going to cause any program to crash so that's literally all we're looking for so we're making sure as we fuzz through this it's going to drop into this if it drops into this or this there's three paths inside of this main um it's going to crash right so and that's just kind of uh you know, a sanity check for us to make sure AFL is doing its job, right? It's it's fuzzing the crap out of that. Once it jumps into one of those, you know, we know it's working well. So there's the target. Let's look at the test harness. So with this, it's definitely it's a little bit more complex than the unicorn scripts that we build up on together. Um, but you get the same idea. Like you can see, like here's the configuration. We got the base address. 
we have an end address, the data address, the 300,000, um, all the various sizes here, they're all the same. Um, and you can kind of see a similar flow. We built, I mean, this is just an ARG parser for this to make sure that we get all of the correct values from this right here. Um, but after that, you can see that we're, um, we're using the same pattern, right? So with this, instead of just using the unicorn engine, we're using the AFO unicorn engine, which is just a wrapper around the unicorn engine. And the reason why they wrote a wrapper around it is so it can digest all of that memory state that we're gonna output. I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, but it can consume all of that and set up all the registers correctly for us. So I don't have to go in and say, hey, where I wanna fuzz, REX is equal to seven, RBX is equal to this, RCX, et cetera, with everything, because that'd just be a pain. Um, so we wrote some scripts with uh, GDB, LODB, um, PwnDB, like uh, various tools that you can just basically just output all of this. Um, but other than that, you know, we can follow along. We got the data is getting mapped to the data address, right? Um, we're rolling down here. Here's the emulation itself. And then we have a couple little nuances with the way the AFL works. And so th this project itself was basically based on AFL QMU. Um, so who's familiar with QMU in here? Okay, cool. So it just, it emulates stuff for you. And it's really, really nice to use. A lot of times it's a pain in the ass, but there's, it's very nice to use a lot of times. Um, but it does emulation. It also reaches down and does some virtualization at times. Um, but this is based completely on emulation. So they, they forked that. Um, but one of the nuances with it is having to start um, the fork server for AFL before you, you have to start it once, run an instruction, and then you can start emulating because of the way that AFL is actually constructed itself. So there's a fork server and because basically spinning up a new process every single time is very intensive on your CPU and it just takes time, it takes resources. So it basically has a fork server that keeps forking that, that first parent process into children and it'll, it's, that's lightning fast. So like that can consume stuff a lot faster. And that's just, that's just basically just a um, part of AFL itself. So like a lot of different tools have to deal with this as well. Um, but that's what you see right here. Run one instruction to start the fork server. And then down here, um, this is where you see where it says args.buffer content. That is officially our AFL output. So this is writing that AFL output to the data address, just like we want, right? So we want to put whatever AFL outputted right into that spot, just so our, our target binary, once it hits it, hopefully it makes it crash. And so that's, that's where this is happening right here. Um, and the rest of this stuff, this is the emulation itself. Um, so this is just a try except with various architectures. If we're using whichever one it is, it's going to print out stuff correctly for that architecture. Um, and for the sake of this presentation, that's plenty for you to understand of what's going on in here. Um, it, the test harness stitches together what we see as unicorn with what we're getting from AFL. And that's everything that we see in here with that little nuance of, uh, of AFL. So, I mean, it's very similar to those basic harnesses that, or those basic uh, scripts that I showed you guys. So you can build these yourself and you can start throwing this at various targets, whatever targets it is. Don't do anything legal. Um, but yeah, the unicorn, I can just very briefly gloss over this unicorn loader. This is where that AFL unicorn engine comes from. Um, I'll just skim through this. Um, yeah, so it has a heap implementation, so it can take care of that. And that's for setting up all the correct stuff that we're gonna get from the state dump. Um, you guys can read this fast, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is actually what I implemented, um, this Dynamo Rio helper. Turns out the Lighthouse uses, has anybody heard of Dynamo, Dynamo Rio? 
Okay, it's actually a really big project and it's used for binary instrumentation. I didn't hear of it until I started this project though and it turns out Lighthouse uses its coverage log file format um, to actually like basically digest that and make all the pretty colors and stuff. So we had to implement a way to produce those logs and that's what's happening right here. Um, and then here's the AFO Unicorn Engine itself. And this is doing all of the, the interesting stuff of like taking up, so the context, the process context that we're gonna dump, you'll see context in here, context, context. Like that is, that is the AFO Unicorn Engine doing everything that we did, setting up the registers for us. So like if you, if you look through this, this is what's, what's going on in here. Um, so that's enough of this file. You just have to basically understand like, that's this is doing all the heavy lifting for us right there um let's see what else do we want to hit on we have the log file the logs.py is going to create the logs for us afterwards for lighthouse and the make file i can just briefly show this is going to make our target for us with gcc um, it's going to make another debug directory so we can just output stuff if we needed to debug it's good for like development and whatnot um, AFL, this is exactly that command that I showed you guys earlier, um, except this one actually has this. So this is the, the flag that I added. So again, it's the same everything. Um, we have all the A AFL commands, we have the test harness, we have the unicorn context debug, but this is what we added in this IRAD right here. And this is what we finally get. We get the coverage, we get AFL, we get the stack data and everything else that, that comes along with it. Um, so yeah, we're going to run that, and it's also going to log the coverage in that Dynamo Rio format. Um, I have a test script right here. We don't have to use this. I use this for a sanity check to make sure that my test harness doesn't crash. Um, this is how we're going to generate the logs. It basically just creates a logs file, runs the script, uh, gives it the, the context, and then basically just that Dynamo Rio class inside of it just outputs everything. And then I bet you can't you can't guess what clean does so okay so we got make target so we made this guy so now we have to get that context right we have to get the target context we have to get um, debug it in one way or another we could use LDB or whatnot but I'm familiar with GDB so we're gonna use uh, GDB on the target um, does anyone use Jeff yeah yeah no I nice so I was using uh, PETA for a while or GDB dashboard. Both awesome, make GDB a whole different experience. Um, until I came along Mr. Jeff. And uh, I like Jeff partially because his name is Jeff and <laughs> more so because of what he gives out. It's just a very easy to use. Um, I think to PETA was abandoned too. I don't think it was. It was, abandoned. yeah. And so like once that kind of like started to like basically go belly up, I was like, all right, I need to find something new. And GDB dashboard is also sweet. Um, but Jeff is Jeff, so I'm gonna, <laughs> he's my man. So, all right, but we're gonna basically break it, uh, break it main. And so you guys, if you were looking at the test harness um, at the base address that I assigned, I had 400, 148. And so that's where I got that from. And if I wanna look at um, the end address, cause I have to actually end, end it particularly where I wanted to stop emulation with this binary, I can run it. And then disassemble this, and I can look at the end is 487, and that's what I put in for the end address, right? So at this point, um, it's not a command, my man Jeff. Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to import the uh, the helper scripts that I was talking about. So I just know it's in this directory back here, but you can assume that you ha you're going to have access to helper scripts as well. Um, but there's the unicorn uh, dumper for GDB, IDA, LDB, Pwn debug, and then there's that unicorn letter that I showed you guys that actually contains the engine itself. I just put it in the di same directory as me. Um, so I'm going to use the GDB one, the dumper GDB. And wham, we get uh, three segments and it outputted a bunch of stuff to an index.json file. So I'm going to get out of Jeff, see what we got. So this is new. Right, so that unicorn context. So I'm just gonna real quickly move that to unicorn context. And the only reason I'm doing that is because my make file um, 
I'm lazy and don't feel like writing the whole command and my make file is adjusted for that right here. So I'm basically just putting exactly what we just got into this right here, but just to show you guys. Um, but yeah, let's, let's check out what's inside of here. So we have four dot bin files. Yeah, dot bin files with hashes. Um, so each one of those are gonna be different segments inside of the, the binary itself. That's how it gets the information inside of there. And then we have an index.json. So you know, on context index um, and this is pretty tight right so we got we got all the registers these are all the values like we would have had to have manually assigned all of these if we were to create a unicorn script or a test harness um, we got all the segments with all the permissions we have the start of the segment the end of the segment the name of the segment um, all the above like we get we literally get everything for free just by running that script what architecture it is and so this just this completely alleviates the pain <laughs> of setting this up. Um, so once we in the unicorn or the AFO unicorn engine digests this and sets everything up for us. And if I'm beating a dead horse, good. Um, it helps you understand. So all right, so we got we got make target, we got the unicorn. So let's see if this will run. So make AFL. Um, all right, so this is something with AFL, you have to typically do this as well. Um, you have to echo that core into the core pattern in the, in the kernel. Um, so then you have to do that as freaking root. So put this in there. Pattern. All right, exit. Let's make AFL. All right, cool. So it's telling us that we're all set and ready to roll. So we wait and we go past baseball, we go drink a beer, we go call our moms, tell her that we love her, and we come back and look for crashes. And it looks like we already have crashes. So we have two crashes here, that's exciting. Um, and you can kind of imagine what's going on in that target binary, right? Um, we're flipping all the bits. We're using different algorithms. Havoc right now. Um, it's going down different function paths, right? It's going down different paths inside of the same function. And if it has a unique path or a unique crash, that means that it went down a different branch or it hit different basic blocks on that crash itself. So it looks like we have four crashes here. That's beautiful um, because we had three we had three paths inside with the conditional, and then we had just the final, you know, return zero. So like we have four routes. That's that's amazing. So we can get out of this. Also, AFL does run forever, um, so you have to kill it. If I've seen some people, <coughs> excuse me, run AFL for like a month at a time on like let's just say that like a kernel or something or like a, a function that you believe is vulnerable and you just keep wanting to hammer away. I don't know how useful that is, um, but they have, they've ran it for a long time. So that's just, you can run it as long as you want, but thankfully our example is pretty simple. Um, so I'm going to make some logs. So this is what created those Dynamo Rio coverage logs. And this is what Lighthouse is going to be able to consume, right? Um, so what does that look like inside of logs? We have there, and then the results of AFL are in here. So if you'll notice, each one of these log files, 0 through 3, and then we have crashes 0 through 3. So each of these log files correlate to a particular crash. So Lighthouse is going to be able to just digest that and basically output everything for us. Um, the queue, this is actually everything that AFL, so it uses the results directory to kind of keep track of where it's at in the state and where it's where it's at in its fuzzing process and all that. Um, so it uses this, even though it's like kind of like misleading because it's the results. Like this is still like this is actually the queue that I was about to just start firing away at it. Um, but yeah, important thing to note is we have four logs and four crashes, and so let's get this over into Ida and check this out. And of course, it paused itself. So let's let Windows come back to life. What else do we have? 
cool. So we got some tools. Um, yeah, so we got the unicorn scripts, lighthouse, unicorn, AFL. Is it useful to post the slides up for you guys after this? Or I can like, yeah, I can like, cool. I can like send them your way after this. Um, let's see if Windows is alive. Cool. All right, so I already have the binary loaded up. Um, let's take a look at this real quick. You can see kind of down here in the bottom left hand corner. Um, but that's that's peruse over this. We have this is our main function, right? Because um, it's our only function because it's a tiny ass binary. Um, but we have three basic um, paths that we can take, and this is perfectly aligns with what we suspect, right? We had those conditionals, and then we have that final return of zero. Um, so this is something. This is not taking us off guard or anything. This is exactly what we expect. Um, that's good for a sanity check, but let's go ahead and bring those files in. So once you install, you have to install Lighthouse into Ida or Binary Ninja or Ghidra. I think that's going to happen here in the future. Um, basically, you it you get this little uh, drop down where you can bring in a code coverage file right here. Click on this guy, and then I have the logs over here already. They're going to be the same as what we got, you know, from the output. I'm going to open these up, and then it takes us to a coverage overview. So over here, um, this is this little slick drop-down. Um, we have A, B, C, and D. Each one of these are crashes, right? So let's take a look at crash number A. What the heck happened in here? All right, we got the start. You know, obviously it's got to start somewhere, and it looks like, okay, it ended at this block. That's cool. Um, what about B? What happened in B? All right, so we got, okay, all right, we got a different path. We got start here, down here, and looks like it drops down to the second ending right here, which we would expect, right? Um, we got C, and okay, so it's a common pattern, but we get to see each crash. This is awesome, because we can get visualize where exactly all this happened. Um, but something that uh, kind of sets this above just visualizing and just being able to like pick out particular crashes is we can actually do set mathematics with this um, on each crash so it stores the basic blocks as a set and we're able to do like uh, you know and or unions or like you know intersections and all that kind of stuff and we're able to see like well, what if we want to see like what's different between crash b and a or something or crash c and d or what's, what does A and B have in similarity? We can add those together. Um, so let's do A, uh, let's do A minus B. Let's try this guy. A gives us a new composition name. Now we're on E. And I am going to expect it's only the last, yeah. So this is the only difference. Um, but that's awesome, right? So I mean, if we get a crap ton of crashes, we're able to analyze these and say, this crash is different than this crash. This is the difference between this crash and it's right in your face. Um, so this makes the job, you know, whether it's CTFs or whether it's us just doing work on embedded devices, doing reverse engineering, you know, doing some like um, some, some real work, like this makes this process so much easier. Um, and that's, this is something that happens like even in just in the cybersecurity community. I mean, you can look at like at the slides that we have. I mean, right here, we'll do this. Um, AFL, Unicorn, Lighthouse, all independently created tools. And we had some creative guys that are just like, just gonna merge these together, merge these together and use these as a total. And you get pretty kick-ass stuff like this. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's all I have, guys. So, um, does anybody have any questions or comments, concerns? That was great. Cool. Good job. Thank you, guys. I also have a lot of stickers. <laughs> so if anyone wants Patel stickers, and um, yeah, if you have resumes, I'll take them. So.
let me know. Or if you want to ask any questions, I'm uh, I'm here. Also going to Ryan guys. So if you're 21 or older, feel free to come <laughs> to Ryan guys.